kinds of warfare mean new kinds of weapons and armaments. In this latest and greatest of all wars, the aircraft carrier is an indispensable unit of the modern fleet. It has eyes that range across hundreds of miles of sea. Bombers and torpedo bombers to act as long-range artillery before the ships attack. Fighters to beat off enemy aircraft from her sea-bound sisters. In this war, it's true to say that a navy without aircraft carriers is as unthinkable as an air force without airplanes. Latest additions to the British Navy, our aircraft carriers demonstrate every day their vital importance to the progress of the war. So much for the work of the aircraft carrier as seen from the public viewpoint. We know, however, that behind these vital and at times dramatic activities, there is an immense amount of detailed, painstaking work involving the use of ingenious and sometimes complex apparatus. Let's have a look at the layout of a modern aircraft carrier. Here's the after end of the flight deck, almost entirely covered with devices for assisting aircraft to land. First, the after lift. There's another forehead, which we'll see in a minute. Then the arrestor wires, which vary in number from four in an auxiliary to eight on the modern carriers. They are about 24 feet apart and have a pullout of 120 to 150 feet. Then the trickle wire, which is only for stopping slow-moving aircraft. It has a pullout of 40 feet. Next, the two safety barriers. Some carriers have three. They are hydraulically raised or lowered as required and are adjustable up to seven feet. These two forward arrestor wires are for landings over the bow. The accelerator is situated here on the port side. Then there are the windscreens, and finally, the forward lift. This diagram is just to give you an idea of the general layout, and we'll deal with all the devices in detail later on. Now we'll review a complete cycle of flying operations, starting with the aircraft being ranged on deck. Here's one going up now. The aircraft are ranged some time before they are due to fly off as it's necessary to get them properly stowed on deck. Method of ranging depends on the number of aircraft in the range, the amount of wind speed available, and the amount of deck space to be used. Aircraft are always handled with folded wings, which are spread when each plane is in position, if space permits. This diagram shows the method of ranging with spread wings. In this way, the aircraft can be flown off very rapidly. The time taken for an aircraft to taxi to the center of the deck and take off is about 10 seconds. And this method can be used for as many as 21 aircraft with light load and strong wind. When more aircraft are in the range or a longer run is necessary, they are ranged in threes abreast with wings folded, their wings being spread as each aircraft taxis to the center of the deck to take off. Using this method and with good drill, aircraft can fly off about once every 10 seconds. Before dealing with a normal takeoff, let's look at the accelerator, which is a form of catapult hydro-pneumatically operated. This device enables aircraft to be got into the air with as much as 25 knots of beam wind, but less for port beam wind in the case of certain types of aircraft, this being due to its position near the port side of the deck. Aircraft can be launched about every 45 seconds. When all is ready, the pilot gives the OK and the deck officer, by waving his green flag with a circular motion, gives him the signal to build up his revs. When the moment arrives, the flag is dropped and off she goes. So much for the accelerated takeoff of a lightweight machine. But heavier jobs can get off just as easily. For instance, here's an albacore loaded with a torpedo. The only difference is that it has to have its tail raised in order to get it onto the trolley. The accelerated takeoff is of great assistance and has many advantages in the tactical operation of carriers.
slow motion shot shows what happens as the aircraft leaves the trolley. Now we'll get back to the squadron which is fully ranged aft. The rear gunners, observers and pilots get into their places in the aircraft and are helped into their harness by the mechanic. This, by the way, is the correct order for getting aboard. First the gunner, then the observer, and lastly, the pilot. Now they're all set to go. engines are running, the petty officer in charge of the flight reports to the deck control officer who gives the signal to commander flying. He is installed on his own bridge on the island, in close contact with the captain on the compass platform. From his lofty position, the commander flying has a view of the entire flight and can see everything that's going on. Be quiet for four, five firing, we'll close up other range at 16 stand. On receipt of the deck control officer's signal, orders are given for the ship to be turned into the wind. Meanwhile, the deck control officer brings the first aircraft into position for takeoff by working red and blue flags. Pilots must watch the signals closely and so must the men handling the chops. As soon as the stop signal is given, the chocks must be placed in position to prevent the aircraft moving back. When the steam jet shows that the ship is into the wind, Commander Flying shows a green flag from his bridge. This is the executive signal for flying off, and the deck control officer proceeds with the operation. Chocks away is the first signal, and the aircraft must now be held on the brakes until the green flag is dropped, which signal is given for each individual aircraft. This green flag is only used for the takeoff. As soon as one aircraft is cleared of the takeoff position, another is brought up into its place and the operation proceeds automatically. Pilots must be on the alert and respond immediately to all signals from the control officer and his assistants. In this way, and with good drill and cooperation, aircraft can take off at intervals of 10 to 12 seconds. take off, they either proceed independently or to a pre-arranged squadron forming up position, which is generally on the bow of the carrier. When the commander flying changes his flag or panel from green to red, all flying off operations must stop. Now that they're off, we'll have a closer look at the gear that will be ready to help them to land when they return. The arrestor gear, consisting of wires stretched across the deck at regular intervals, occupies a large portion of the deck. Here's a close view of one of the arrestor wires, showing how normally it lies flat on the deck and is raised and lowered hydraulically for landing. The trickle wire usually has two lifters. The safety barriers, two or three, are amidships, each consisting of a wire net stretched between two stanchions. The principal landing on signals are go slower, go faster, go higher, go lower. Steady as you go, go around again.
cut your engine. In fine weather conditions, the batsman is situated right aft, and an aircraft which responds to his signal should normally pick up the first or second wires. For rough weather landings on a pitching deck, the batsman takes up a position about here, and he will bring the aircraft into land more amidships where the effect of the pitching is less. On returning, aircraft always go to the waiting position, usually one mile on the quarter or astern of the carrier. As soon as the carrier is ready, the squadron distinguishing flag is shown at number one boom port. One subflight of the squadron then closes the ship. Each pilot prepares for landing by lowering his hook. Individual aircraft then circle round the carrier in readiness to land. When the commander flying is satisfied that conditions are suitable for landing, the affirmative flag is displayed at number two boom port. This is also repeated by the mechanical shutter. It is the permissive signal for aircraft to approach the deck only, and the executive signal for the deck landing control officer to commence landing on aircraft. From now onwards, each pilot is under the orders of the control officer. All his signals must be obeyed. By making these unmistakable signals, the control officer can bring the pilot to the right height and speed over the after end of the deck, and it is obvious that a pilot who places himself completely in the hands of the deck officer can be sure of making a safe landing. Specially detailed ratings run out and disengage the hook. The aircraft taxis forward, and the barriers are raised in readiness for the next arrival. A little to your right, a little higher, Cut your engine. The pilot closes his throttle, and if the plane is being flown in the right attitude, it will make a good landing. It is essential that all these signals should be obeyed promptly. To make things easy for the hard-working control officer, it is most desirable that aircraft should make a straight approach, stepped up at the correct angle. Let's have a look at that in slow motion. Note the angle, plenty of engine, nose well up. Aircraft hanging on its propeller and sinking steadily towards the deck. The rate of sinking is controlled by the amount of throttle used. We'll keep this slow motion going so that you can see clearly how the hook functions. It catches the wire, the hydraulic resistance comes into play, and the aircraft is smoothly arrested. So far, we've only seen comparatively slow-moving aircraft landing, but with care and obedience to the batsman's signals, fast fighter craft like this martlet can be safely landed on a modern carrier. a bit of excitement, this martlet loses its undercarriage on taking off. Sheer accident, of course, but how's he going to get back? After radioing the ship, he turns and comes in, while out goes a red flag on deck to signal a dangerous landing, and everybody on the carrier tenses himself for what may turn out to be an almighty great prank. Down he comes, and makes a perfect belly landing, thereby proving that a good pilot who keeps his head will still have a future before him. The latest experiments in fast landing aircraft have been with a modified Spitfire, known to the fleet air arm as the Seafire. Now you're going to see the very first deck landing by one of these craft. Again, obedience to the batsman's signals brings the pilot into a pretty good landing. In order to demonstrate the use of the safety barrier, let's take a slow motion view of a Fulmer aircraft which misses the deck wires and lands up in the barrier with a minimum of damage to itself. Another aircraft is closely following, so the deck officer has to wave him round again. The introduction of a safety barrier has so speeded up the cycle of landing that aircraft must back each other up at about 20 second intervals so that if it is necessary for the control officer to send one round again, in this case, for instance, because a damaged aircraft is being cleared, there is another aircraft ready to land very shortly afterwards. 
A high rate of landing aircraft is very necessary for the efficient operation of the ship, and this can only be achieved if aircraft space themselves and back up so that the next one is about to touch down as soon as the barriers go up. After landing, as soon as the aircraft has been freed from the wire, a rating standing on the port side where the pilot can see him signals by means of arm movements and directs him forward of the barriers. You will realize from what you have seen that controlled landings are of the utmost importance both to experienced and inexperienced pilots. This control makes it possible for pilots with little carrier experience to be sent on operational flights confident in the knowledge that they will land safely. Even an experienced pilot can appreciate putting himself in the hands of the control officer when he returns from a long operational flight, especially at night. By the way, controlled landings work on the same principle at night. Each aircraft has three small lights to show its position and attitude, and the control officer, who never sleeps, of course, uses illuminated bats. Whether it's night or day, put your trust in the control officer. He'll let you down lightly. Now, here's a landing which shows all the faults which should be avoided. The aircraft is brought in too fast, too high, and drifting. The pilot ignores the control officer's signals, and the resulting catastrophe is just what might have been expected. A very poor display, and not one to be emulated. Let's send him back to make another approach. Having landed to everybody's satisfaction, let's see what goes on forward to the barrier. We've got a lot of aircraft on hand, and they have to be tucked away with neatness and dispatch, and there's a lot of action going on here. As soon as the aircraft is clear of the barrier, its wings are folded. Each squadron has a special party told off for this job, and they pounce on the aircraft directly it comes to rest. As soon as it's folded, it waits its turn above the lift or parked on one side. There's always an officer or senior rating who decides on the destination of each aircraft. The lift cycle for striking down is about two minutes per aircraft. And as they are landing on about every half minute, a large number will accumulate in the park. Stowage, therefore, calls for a lot of thought. Still, if the drill and organization are right, parking and striking down will fit like a glove. Just as with landing, it's all a matter of control and obedience. 